on World News Tonight. A total success. The top leader of Al-Qaeda killed in a counter-terror strike in Afghanistan. Taiwan visit. Pelosi to visit Taiwan despite Beijing warnings of China making a show of force. Brutal shelling. Russian missiles hit Ukraine's port of Mykolaiv, killing country's main grain exporter. It's an ice cream museum. China's frozen dessert-themed indoor carnival welcomes visitors with a sweet tooth. This is Ada Derana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Suzanne Chanelli. Good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. A U.S. drone strike in Afghanistan is believed to have killed one of the world's most notorious terror masterminds. Biden called the mission a total success and said that he hopes to bring one more measure of closure to families of victims of the 2001 September 11th attacks. The leader of al-Qaeda was killed by a U.S. drone strike in Afghanistan's capital over the weekend, according to President Joe Biden on Monday, in the biggest blow to the militant group since founder Osama bin Laden was killed 11 years ago. My fellow Americans, on Saturday, at my direction, the United States successfully concluded an airstrike in Kabul, Afghanistan that killed the emir of al-Qaeda, Iman al-Zawiri. None of his family members were hurt, and there were no civilian casualties. I'm sharing this news with the American people now, after confirming the mission's total success through the painstaking work of our counterterrorism community and key allies and partners. Zawahiri, an Egyptian surgeon who had a $25 million bounty on his head, succeeded bin Laden as al-Qaeda leader after years as its main organizer and strategist. Zawahiri helped coordinate the 9-11 attacks that killed nearly 3,000 people in New York City. Biden also said he masterminded or played a key role in attacks on the USS Cole in the year 2000 that left 17 sailors dead, as well as on two African U.S. embassies two years prior, which left hundreds dead and thousands more wounded. No matter how long it takes, no matter where you hide, if you are a threat to our people, the United States will find you and take you out. A Taliban spokesperson confirmed the weekend strike and strongly condemned it. That drone attack is the first known U.S. strike inside Afghanistan since U.S. troops and diplomats left the country in 2021. It could also solidify Washington's assurances that it can still address threats from Afghanistan even without a military presence in the country. Republican and Democratic lawmakers lauded the weekend strike. But Zawahiri's presence in Kabul now raises questions about whether he received sanctuary from the Taliban after they swept back into power last year. One U.S. official said senior Taliban officials were aware that Zawahiri was in Kabul and said Washington expected the Taliban to abide by an agreement not to allow al-Qaeda fighters to re-establish themselves in the country. Clarence House, the residence of Prince Charles, has disputed claims reported in the UK that the heir to the throne brokered a deal in 2013 to accept a £1 million charity donation from Osama bin Laden's half-brothers. Tonight, a Prince Charles charity is facing questions after a British newspaper report reveals they accepted a donation from the family of Osama bin Laden. The report, published by the Sunday Times, disclosing that the Prince of Wales Charitable Fund accepted a donation of £1 million from Bakir and Shafiq bin Laden, both half-brothers of Osama bin Laden, in 2013. The Sunday Times report alleges the Prince brokered the donation despite appeals from advisors not to take the money. An account Prince Charles's Clarence House office disputes. A spokesperson for the Prince of Wales confirmed that the Charitable Fund accepted the 2013 bin Laden family donation adding that the decision to take the money was made by the charity's board of trustees alone, and that the Prince of Wales was not involved in the brokering or acceptance of the funds. It's a bad look for Prince Charles. The Charity Commission, which is the supervisory body of charities in this country, has basically said there's been no wrongdoing. But from the public's point of view, I'm afraid this is just another case of members of the royal family taking money from unsavory sources. This isn't the first time questions have come up about the operation of Prince Charles's charities. 
Last year, a top aide of the prince stepped down after claims that aide helped a Saudi billionaire gain British citizenship and honors in return for donations to another of Prince Charles's charities. Clarence House has said the prince had no knowledge of the cash for citizenship arrangement. There's been controversies about Prince Charles before and where money for his charities has come from. What will the royal family do? The answer is pretty much nothing. They'll weather the storm. They'll carry on regardless. The White House described Beijing's rhetoric over an expected visit by House Speaker Nancy Pelosi to Taiwan, vowing the United States will not take the bait or engage in saber rattling and has no interest in increasing tensions with China. U.S. Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi was set to visit Taiwan on Tuesday, three sources said, as the U.S. said it wouldn't be intimidated by Chinese threats to not sit idly by if she made the trip to visit the self-ruled island claimed by Beijing. One source told that the United States had informed some allies about Pelosi's visit to Taiwan. Two other sources said Pelosi was scheduled to meet a small group of activists who are outspoken about China's human rights record during her stay in Taiwan, possibly on Wednesday. Taiwan's foreign ministry said it had no comment on reports of Pelosi's travel plans. Pelosi's office said on Sunday that she was leading a congressional delegation to the region that would include visits to Singapore, Malaysia, South Korea and Japan. It did not mention Taiwan. Chinese Foreign Ministry spokesman Zhao Lijian said at a daily briefing on Monday that a Pelosi visit would lead to serious consequences. If U.S. House of Representatives Speaker Pelosi goes to Taiwan, it will be a gross interference in China's internal affairs, seriously undermine China's sovereignty and territorial integrity, wantonly trample on the One China principle, seriously threaten peace and stability in the Taiwan Strait, and seriously damage China-U.S. relations, leading to very serious developments and consequences. We would like to tell the United States once again that China is standing by, and the Chinese People's Liberation Army will never sit idly by, and that China will take resolute responses and strong countermeasures to defend its sovereignty and territorial integrity. Beijing considers Taiwan to be part of its territory and has never renounced using force to bring the island under its control. Taiwan rejects China's sovereignty claims and says only its people can decide the island's future. China views visits by U.S. officials to Taiwan as sending an encouraging signal to the pro-independence camp in the island. Washington does not have official diplomatic ties with the island, but is bound by U.S. law to provide it with the means to defend itself. A video by the People's Liberation Army, which showed scenes of military exercises and preparations, was posted to state media sites Monday evening. National Security Council spokesman John Kirby dismissed China's rhetoric as groundless and inappropriate at a White House press briefing Monday. The Speaker has the right to visit Taiwan, and the Speaker of the House has visited Taiwan before, without incident, as have many members of Congress, including this year. Put simply, there is no reason for Beijing to turn a potential visit consistent with long-standing U.S. policy into some sort of crisis or conflict. Republican Newt Gingrich was the last House Speaker to visit Taiwan in 1997, a visit by Pelosi, who is second in the line of succession to the U.S. presidency and a longtime critic of China, would come amid worsening ties between Washington and Beijing. Still in the United States, the New York State Department of Health updated New Yorkers on polio in York State following the identification of a case of polio in Rockland County resident. The polio virus was detected in samples of wastewater. The polio virus was present in wastewater in a New York City suburb a month before health officials announced a confirmed case of the disease last month. That's according to state health officials Monday, who are now urging residents to be sure they have been vaccinated. The discovery of the disease from wastewater samples collected in June means the virus was present in the community before the Rockland County adults diagnosis was made public July 21st. The U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention said in an emailed statement that the presence of the virus in wastewater indicates there may be more people in the community with the virus. However, the CDC added there may have been no new cases identified and that it is not yet clear whether the virus is actively spreading in New York or elsewhere in the United States. There is no cure for polio, once one of the most feared diseases, given its ability to cause irreversible paralysis in some cases. 
but it can be prevented by a vaccine made available in 1955. New York officials have said they are opening vaccine clinics to help unvaccinated residents get their shots. The United States has not seen a polio case generated in the country since 1979, although cases from a traveler and an oral vaccine were found in 1993 and 2013. Let's go into a short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more World News. Welcome back to World News Tonight. Now, Ukraine has finally begun shipping grain out of its Black Sea port again after months of blockade under a safe passage agreement with Russia and with hope that it will help ease global food shortages. The first cargo vessel to leave Ukraine carrying a grain shipment has finally sailed from the Black Sea port of Odessa after being blockaded there since the Russian invasion began five months ago. Ukraine's government is calling it a day of relief, and the Kremlin has called the Rizoni's departure very positive news. Russia and Ukraine make up nearly a third of the world's grain exports. And the conflict has worsened the global cost of living crisis, particularly for countries threatened by food shortages and hunger. Uh, a young engineer named Abdullah Jendi is aboard the vessel, which is bound for Lebanon. He's been sharing these images. He says it's an indescribable feeling to be going back home, like being freed from detention after a long time. Every day, he says, the alarm would go off in the port, and he and his crew would be afraid they might accidentally be hit in an attack. He's still scared of explosive mines left in these waters. He thinks it could take the ship two or three hours to get out of the area safely. The shipment is the result of the safe passage agreement made between Russia and Ukraine's government last month. Video released by emergency services is said to show the aftermath. The United Nations is warning of multiple famines this year. Russia denies responsibility for the food crisis and blames Western sanctions for slowing exports, and it blames Ukraine for the mines. The Ukraine president's office has previously said that 17 ships are docked waiting departure on the Black Sea, with almost 600,000 tons of cargo, most of it grain. Shelling by Russian forces in and around Ukraine killed the owner of the country's biggest ag agricultural company, a man President Zelensky called a hero. This comes as the first shipment of grain left the port of Odessa under a deal brokered by the UN. Ukraine on Sunday saw what its president called the most brutal shelling of the entire war so far. Specifically in the Mykolaiv region, where most of the country's wheat, barley and corn is produced. Ukraine's. Ukrainians, in the last 24 hours, Mykolaiv and the region has experienced the most brutal shelling of the entire period of the full-scale war. Dozens of missiles and rockets hit residential buildings, schools, social infrastructure and industrial facilities. In one of those strikes, the owner of the country's biggest agricultural company died. President Zelensky paid tribute to him and his wife. The Russian strike took the lives of Alesky Varatursky and his wife Reza, the founder of one of the largest agricultural companies in Ukraine, Nibelon, a hero of Ukraine. My sincere condolences to the family and friends of the couple. It is exactly such people, such companies, our Ukrainian South, that guaranteed the world's food security. This happened on the same day the Turkish presidential spokesperson hinted that Ukraine's grain export ships were ready to leave ports for the first time in months. A Ukrainian grain ship left the port of Odessa on Monday. While the food crisis may be about to ease, the humanitarian crisis remains an issue as the war prolongs. Adding to the already existing tensions, Russian President Vladimir Putin on Sunday signed a new naval doctrine to cast the U.S. as the country's main rival. In a new 55-page naval doctrine, Putin said Russia may use its military force to strengthen its own geopolitical position and safety in the Arctic and Black Seas. Recession fears haunt the Eurozone. The Eurozone's manufacturing activity shrank last month, with factories being forced to stockpile unsold items as a result of weak demand. This has raised concerns that the region could enter a recession. Manufacturing activity contracted across the Eurozone last month, 
That's according to a closely watched survey released on Monday. S&P Global's final manufacturing purchasing managers index fell to 49.8 in July, down from June's 52.1. It's the first time the PMI has gone below 50 since June 2020. Anything below that figure represents a contraction. S&P said Eurozone manufacturing faces an increasingly steep downturn and it all adds to the risk of recession in the region. It blamed lower than expected sales, which had forced factories to stockpile unsold goods. S&P said it saw the largest rise in unsold stocks of finished goods ever recorded by the survey. The new orders index fell to 42.6 from 45.2 the lowest since May 2020 when the health crisis led to lockdowns worldwide. Production was falling in all countries surveyed other than the Netherlands. S&P said the rate of decline was a particular worry in the bloc's three biggest economies, France, Germany and Italy. The Eurozone's numbers follow the US economy contracting unexpectedly last quarter, stoking fears it was on the brink of recession. There was some light for the Eurozone though, an early reading showed Friday that its economy grew faster than expected last quarter, but a July reading still gave a 45% chance of a recession within a year. Thousands of demonstrators opposed to Iraq's powerful cleric Maqtada al-Sadr staged a protest at the edge of Baghdad's fortified government zone where Sadr's supporters were holding an open-ended occupation of Iraq's parliament. <laughs> The other camp takes to the streets of Baghdad, three days after supporters of Muqtada al-Sadr stormed the parliament. Security is tight to avoid any confrontation between the two groups. The parliament was stormed by our Shiite brothers, who made a laughing stock of us, the members of other political parties, in view of the whole world. So we're here to rehabilitate the state's power, to protect Iraq. Those other political parties, many of them close to Iran, make up a parliamentary majority and had tried to name a new prime minister last week. Yet al Sadr urged his supporters to contest that by storming the parliament. Since then, the standoffs paralyzed Iraqi politics. This is a coup d'etat which is being carried out by the current prime minister and his advisors with the help of the Sadrists. They're trying to stop the formation of a new government. The protesters give it one almighty push and manage to get past the barriers ever closer to the parliament building. But the security forces hold them back. If our leadership tells us to increase the pressure, then we'll do it. If they tell us to keep things peaceful, then we'll do that too. This protest was largely contained. Indeed, many of the leaders of their political alliance are calling for dialogue. Despite those entreaties, the threat of an inter-Shiite conflict looms large in Iraqi society. We have some good news for you. A job interview is perhaps the most daunting part of the job hunting experience. Well, with that thought in mind, South Korea has been employing VR technology to offer job seekers a chance to practice. This is a job cafe in Ursan. It provides various services to help young people find employment. Roughly 20 to 30 people visit the cafe each day. It has an area that allows people to experience a mock job interview using VR. Once users enter the virtual interview room, which looks like the real thing, they will face two AI interviewers who will ask tough questions to simulate the high-pressure atmosphere of an actual interview. When business management deteriorates, which do you think is more desirable from the company's point of view, a reduction in personnel or a reduction in wages? I will study more to build professional knowledge about the job and I'll get a good score. The interviewer's expression even changes depending on the respondent's answer. I tried using VR before a job interview and it helped me get rid of any anxiety I had. I think VR will be helpful for the actual interview. Two out of ten VR interviewees succeeded in finding a job. These mock VR interviews have helped people who are unprepared develop their interview skills. A lot of local young people are saying that they have helped a lot. With news that employment opportunities are increasing in South Korea, virtual reality technology is seen as a tool which can help boost the nation's employment rate further.
welcome back to World News Tonight. And for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. A landmark surgery using virtual reality has separated three-year-old twins who were conjoined at the head, requiring nearly 100 medical staff, seven surgeries and 33 hours of treatment. A team in Brazil performed the operations. It was complicated as the twins were born with fused brains and a shared vital artery. French President Emmanuel Macron vowed to further support Ukraine's grain exports along with other European partners in a phone conversation held between Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky and his French counterpart. Myanmar's military has declared a six-month extension to its emergency rule, citing the need for stability amid internal clashes. Junta leader Ming Ang Lang claimed that efforts to implement a peace plan have been stalled due to instability. Floods unleashed by torrential rains in eastern Kentucky have killed at least 37 people, including four children. Governor Andy Bashir said while warning that more dangerous weather is approaching the region. British Foreign Secretary Liz Truss, bid to become the next Prime Minister, got a major boost when she received the backing of a lawmaker she narrowly defeated to make it to the final two candidates vying to replace Boris Johnson. And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow for more news around the globe. In case you missed to watch any of the stories we aired tonight, you can always re-watch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. We're leaving you tonight with a look at the frozen desert theme indoor carnival opening doors to the public in China. Stay safe and have a good night.